Battle Royale without the Fortnite. Fortnite Battle Pass. I don't know what's wrong with me. <laughs> Battle Royale by Caution Takami is like the start of the Battle Royale genre type of books. We're talking about The Hunger Games, Divergent, you know, Lord of the Flies. This book obviously inspired Lord of the Flies. But no, I mean, this is like Lord of the Flies or The Hunger Games on steroids. So the book is set in a fascist Japan, which seems to have taken over most of Eastern Asia post-World War II. They sort of rose to be a superpower. They're fascist. It said multiple times in the book that Japan is fascist. I think some people probably read this book and misread what Japan's supposed to be. They're fascist in this book. I'm just saying. So in this fascist Japan, or Greater East Asia as it's called, they have this game. It's called The Program and happens once every year and a group of ninth graders, so 15 year olds, are selected to fight each other out and just kill each other and they're meant to you know be helping the non-aggression forces because they when they win and so all of these kids are put in a location and they have to fight each other to the death much like many of the books that were inspired by this the purpose of the program or the game as they're in the other books is that it's meant to be the government's way of showing their dominance over the people, showing the people that you will not resist us. You cannot trust anyone around you who don't resist us because those around you won't help you. You can't start a revolution because you can't trust the person next to you. It is insane, the, the game in itself. It's brutal. I like that Takami doesn't go too uh, over the top with the program in itself because it's very visceral and very human what's happening in the sense that there's nothing external that's really causing these kids to fight each other or die you know there are some rules in the game which is you know spurring them on to kill each other but it's not like the hunger games is really the only example that i could give where there's like little weird dog creatures or the weird like hummingbird things that kill katniss or whatever the game in it, well, the program in itself is very visceral. It's very, here are weapons, you have to kill each other. If someone doesn't die every 24 hours, you all die. And that mentally messes with a lot of the characters. What I was most impressed by was how Takami told the story from multiple different perspectives. We have one main character, Shuya, we follow for the majority of the book. However, at multiple points and for extended sequences, like a few chapters at a time, uh, we are shifted to the perspective of another character. We don't go to all 42 students that are involved in the program, but we go to the main ones, the ones that are named by our main character or the ones where the they have an effect on the outcome of the plot. Obviously, we also visit some of the other students. Mostly, we're showed every single way a student is killed, which is, I believe, I don't think we see that in books like Divergent or The Hunger Games or even Lord of the Flies. Maybe Lord of the Flies, you do actually see all the characters who get killed. But in this, every single time a character is killed, it is either told from their perspective or the perspective of the person who's killed them. It's usually the perspective of the person who killed them if they are a more important character. So if it's like the last guy to die, Kurama, he, his perspective is shown a few times where he's killing different people. Uh, whereas if it's another character who just isn't as important or, you know, dies a less exciting, I mean, I feel bad, it's an exciting way uh, it shows it from their perspective, or if they're not going to be allowed around for very long. See, I understand why the book was banned in Japan for quite a while. It is very gruesome. Uh, it is very graphic. It, there's even, you know, allusions to just disgusting stuff happening, you know, within and outside of the program. But I, I think the gruesomeness of it is all just a way of telling the deeper political message of the book. The book in itself is meant to be a critique of a society that puts so much on this dogged fight of a dog-eat-dog -dog world where you have to fight to survive and the systems that make it so people feel like they need to fight to survive. Again, the book is very much a criticism of fascism 
and the effect it has on the individual and the wider group, how it affects a group to cause individuals to act a certain way. You have certain characters like Shinji who is very open about this is this is exactly what it is. You've got Kawada who also is like, this is fascism, this is why it's like that. Then you have other characters who are slightly less uh, intellectually inclined that way, but they're still describing this feeling of, I'm in a society where I feel like I cannot be myself, but I'm also motivated to have to only care about myself and not the group. I'm in a society where there is some sort of forced homogeny onto me, but also I have to be an individual and can't care too much about the others around me. It's very much, you know, as a lot of people have spoken about this book, is meant to be a critique of Japan to its like furthest extent uh, and also a, which is basically you know if you take a society like Japan or especially World War II Japan and you take it to its fur as far as you can to an extent you could end up with a society like this honestly if this was you know a society in a modern day I wouldn't be surprised because we've got so many countries moving that way anyway. So most of the brutality in this book comes from characters who are either extremely upper class in their society or they're from characters who have been pushed to the very, very brink all of their lives. There are certain characters, like, and with trigger warnings, that have been, you know, forced into prostitution who felt like they've been so destroyed by this world that you know what I'm gonna play this game and I'm gonna get through it or you've got characters who are from this very upper class of society who feel like they're so much better than those around them that they don't feel bad about basically squashing those around them like bugs very much things we both see in our society where violence is often either perpetrated by those who think they are better than others or those who have been pushed so far that they're going to do it. But the book isn't all doom and gloom. We do see some very positive things and very positive messages. You know, the idea of camaraderie and coming together is really pushed by the author, the importance of it, you know, how the characters like uh, Noriko, Kawada and Shuya all, you know, sort of banded together and they were kind of these, this core unit of individuals who respected each other and who helped each other and it really showed as to why they completely operated almost differently to everyone else in the game with a couple of exceptions you know there was um actually there's a manga spin-off of this which tells the story of one group that it goes into it's the girls in the lighthouse i, I don't want to spoil what happens to them but there's the manga which kind of tells their story throughout the game which i might get as well but the book really does show this difference where the people who came together and were respectful and worked together were the ones that did the good things. They helped each other, they helped those around them. They showed that even within a society and an instance like the program that is so forcing you to be so individualistic, a society and a program that is forcing you to not care about others and just kill and be dog eat dog in a society to get forward, there are still people who can come together as groups and try and make everything better. You know. Obviously, Shuya, as our main character, was that archetypical, like, he is the hero, he will not do anything bad, he is the good guy, through and through. And although I don't feel like that's super realistic, the core groups coming together and doing good things together and helping others is a realistic plot point. And it's actually realistic in real world and is what the author is really trying to tell us is how we should function as a group as a society that we are going to help each other and we're going to go against the status quo and we're going to help each other to make things better for everyone and to contrast all the killing that happens in this book there are some very sweet and tender moments and you know these are 15 year olds uh i mean there's a lot of smoking 15 year olds and a lot of 15 year olds who seem to have had a lot of sex in this book and i don't know maybe i was just a dweeb at 15 but i didn't really think that was happening However, there was some extremely sweet moments, especially when it came to characters who were in love with each other, uh, characters confessing to each other. Obviously, our main character had all of the girls trying to confess to him because, you know, it can't be a sort of action teenish type book without that. Uh, but 
a lot of the characters who were in love, it showed this very pure hearted love between them, you know, characters who just couldn't stand the thought of the person they loved being taken from them. Uh, they couldn't stand the fact that they wouldn't be able to live their lives with the person they, they were in love with. It was very heartfelt and it contrasted really well with the sort of characters that were like, I don't give a shit, I'm gonna kill you, my dude. And I thought it was written surprisingly well because when it comes to something like romance in these sort of books, I didn't. I don't really think they work very well. Usually it's very stereotypical or very like, like love triangle forced upon you for drama. There was very little of that. Obviously all the girls liked Shuya, so there was a little bit of that with him, but not really because of the circumstances of the book. So when it came to romantic subplots, it was actually very believable that these were teenagers confessing to each other, and it was teenagers dealing with these feelings of attraction or love that they have with each other. Albeit Noriko was like a little bit too perfect and that's one of my criticisms of the book that one some of the characters that i felt could have been portrayed as stronger or stronger world weren't an example is noriko who is shuya's main love interest she did feel like a damsel in distress for the majority of the book obviously she did give that side to Shuya and Kawada, which was the, you know, it brought out different aspects of them, but her as a character, it felt like she didn't have too much development, and for the most part, she was meant to be the damsel in distress plot device until the very end, but I felt like that came way too late. Uh, and also some of the other female characters didn't get as much development as I would have liked, you know, some of the guys that were killed off early, I felt got better development than the girls that were killed off early. On the other hand, you did have characters like Mitsuko, who I alluded to earlier, who, although they didn't have a lot of character development, there was a lot told about their character to make you understand their motivation. Again, like I said earlier, Noriko felt kind of like a plot device for Shuya and to motivate him, whereas uh, Mitsuko was more of a fully fleshed out character. And I think if they're going to be main characters, I want them to be like, or even sort of side characters of the main characters, I want them to be fleshed out. I don't mind if the characters who were killed off very early didn't really get much development, but the ones that, you know, we stuck around for, we had a couple of chapters with, and the chapters aren't very long, obviously, but the ones that we had some insight into, I wanted all of them to kind of get some development. And I think out of all of them, Noriko, who is around for most of the book, didn't get as much development as I would have liked. My other one gripe with the book is that I felt a little bit padded out. Obviously we did have to see every character get killed or at least hear about how every character got killed. It felt like it was very weighted towards the end of the book, sort of the, sort of the story in itself. But I felt like there were kind of some things that we didn't need so much of. There were a couple of plot devices that, you know, started and they didn't really have a payoff. And I, I get in part that might be sort of part of how it's told that you're really rooting for these characters or you're really against these characters and you want that payoff surrounding them and you don't get it. And it's meant to show the abruptness and the brevity of life, in my opinion. But some of those plot points give me a payoff or at least give me some sort of satisfaction with that it's not a massive gripe because i understand why it was done but it was kind of like this is a 600 page book and some of this stuff you've just you know had the characters do i didn't need them to do it <laughs> but I, I get it you know it's meant to be a sort of epic story uh, the ending and this isn't really a spoiler but it's kind of ends sort of open-ended where i kind of believe that there could have been follow-ups to this book but also i don't like when books have sequels because i feel like then you're just extending the story for me so i, I if it if there is uh auxiliary content to this i will not consume it apart from the movie so stay tuned for something surrounding that that's my thoughts on fortnite <laughs>
I gave the book four stars on Goodreads. I would have given it three and three quarters if I could do quarter stars, but I can't. Uh, if you've read Battle Royale and even watched the film as well, let me know in the comment section down below your thoughts on the book. You know, I do feel like it is, obviously it's a cult classic, so I do encourage you to read it if you are feeling robust enough to be able to, you know, take a lot of the very gruesomeness that's in the book. I will not take that away from it. It is a very gruesome book. And there's a lot of stuff, you know, it's talking about uh, sexual exploitation throughout the book as well. So that's another thing that you need to, you know, think about when you're reading this. But, you know, if you're feeling you can read that, I, I encourage you to read it. I think it's pretty good. And it's also, for me, the first time I've read a book that wasn't written by an American or English author that's sort of this kind of uh, teenage dystopia type book. I feel like it's a little bit older than a teenage book compared to stuff like, uh, you know, The Hunger Games, which is very much a young adult audience. I feel like this is actually a slightly older audience, but it's the first time I sort of read something like that from an author that wasn't, uh, you know, British or American. So it's a very interesting take and perspective on it compared to those sort of young adult authors. Let me know down below what you think about the book. Remember to like, subscribe, share the video with a friend or family member, uh, you know, follow me on my other social medias if you want to, and Hey, stick around, because next time, a little preview, the video is going to be comparing the book to the movie. We'll see kind of why I felt about the two in comparison. Thanks for watching, and I hope you read a great book today.